Thank you all for joining us. My name is Angela Chin, and I'm a senior software engineer at Pivotal. And with me is Nikki Rathi, who's a software engineering manager at Pivotal. And today we'll be talking to you about configuring clusters, optimizing PKS for your use case. So before we begin with the meat of the talk, we just wanted to do a brief introduction of the two of us. Who are we? Why are we talking about this? Well, to start, introductions for myself. As I've said, my name's Angela. I'm a software engineer at Pivotal, currently working on the Cloud Foundry routing team. In the past, I've worked as the anchor of the Cloud Foundry networking team. And I also recently did a stint in Dublin working on the PKS product. Um, I'm based in Santa Monica, California. And in addition to loving all things containers and cloud native, I also love food, hot yoga, hiking, eating calories, burning calories, you know, balance out. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, my name is Nikita Rati, and I am a, so, uh, an engineer in Dublin. Um, I'm currently the anchor of one of the teams that make up PKS. I do love um, eating calories, not so great at burning them, but I do love yoga, I love talks, and I'm like an absolutely average ukulele player. Great. Um, and so one final housekeeping item before we get to the meat of the talk. Quick disclaimer. I'm sure you've seen this in other presentations. Feel free to read at your leisure later. And with that, we'll get to the outline. What exactly are we here talking about today beyond the title of optimizing PKS for your use case? So we're first going to start off by level setting on what PKS is and why PKS. Why do we even care about how to use PKS to optimize our clusters before looking at two different ways that you can set up PKS to optimize for high availability and identity before looking at future plans. So what is PKS, right? How many of you, show of hands in this room, know what PKS is? Good. How many of you have deployed PKS, kicked the tires, tried it out? Okay, great. So we have quite a few people here who have tried out PKS, but also a decent number who haven't. So we're just gonna do a quick primer, try to level set, make sure we're all on the same page on understanding what PKS is and why we even care. And to understand what PKS is, we first need to briefly talk about Kubernetes, right? Because PKS is a um, managed Kubernetes, right? And Kubernetes is a container orchestrator built around Docker. So with Docker, you get the ease of use of creating containers for your different applications. And with Kubernetes, you get that management around your multitudes of containers. So you're able to manage a multitude of different containers for a multitude of different applications. And so with Kubernetes, you can deploy your cluster on-prem, you can deploy it to a cloud IaaS, and you get the experience of having a data center on your laptop, right? It's really easy to interact with the Kubernetes cluster that you've deployed, it's really easy to get workloads applied, your application's up and running, and you get all the power of provisioning um, different, part, different infrastructure through your use of Kubernetes. In addition to having the feeling of the data center on your laptop, you get to choose where exactly you deploy your Kubernetes cluster, right? It's multi-cloud, you can use vSphere, AWS, GCP, Azure, the list goes on and on. So you're not tied in to a single IaaS pr uh, provider. And lastly, we've seen in the past couple of years really a community convergence around Kubernetes. And we've seen a lot of third-party integrations provide even more power than ever before to your Kubernetes experience. So this is just a very, very short list, right, of third-party integrations. If I actually put every single third-party integration on a slide, it wouldn't fit. You wouldn't be able to read it. But we can see here that you get a lot of power from third-party integrations, such as monitoring, distributed tracing, networking solutions, and service meshes, just to name a few things. And you can pick and choose which third-party integrations you want to have as part of your Kubernetes experience. And additionally, a lot of these third-party integrations are really putting Kubernetes as a first-class citizen in terms of who they choose to integrate with and who they choose to support. So we see with the th third-party integrations, you get flexibility of sort of customizing your Kubernetes cluster for your own experience. But beyond just the flexibility of being able to choose different third-party integrations to use, the Kubernetes community really puts flexibility at the forefront of your use case and your experience, right? They want to make sure that you can customize a Kubernetes cluster so that it's optimal for your specific use case. And they do that through a wide variety of different flags, different feature sets, 
Um, and so this flexibility really makes it so that you can create a perfect environment for your specific use case. But with flexibility comes great power, right? And I'm sure you've all heard this before, with great power comes great responsibility. And so you might have all of these different choices for how to configure your Kubernetes cluster that you're overwhelmed. You don't know what the best configuration is. And this is where PKS really comes into play, right? PKS stands for Pivotal Container Service, and it's a managed Kubernetes for multiple clusters. So we see here with a managed Kubernetes, we're providing you sort of safe, sensible, sane defaults for how you might want to customize your Kubernetes cluster, but will still allow you the flexibility to change it, to adapt, to make sure that your cluster is configured in a way that fits your use case. And we also, with PKS, allow this for multiple clusters, right? So you have a multitude of different clusters for a multitude of different use cases. And with PKS, we are really aimed at day two operations. Um, I'm sure you've heard this in other sessions before, but we're really looking beyond just kicking the tires, getting an environment set up that's ideal for you, but how do you maintain that environment? How do you see it actually running production workloads? How do you upgrade it with confidence? And with PKS, we see the solution for that is through using Bosch. And Bosch, of course, is a tool aimed at managing complex distributed production systems. In this case, we see that Kubernetes is a complex distributed system. So it seems like a natural fit to use Bosch to also deploy and provision Kubernetes clusters. And it presents a lot of benefits to PKS, such as stem cell security fixes. So we see sometimes that there are CVEs in your underlying OS layer in the kernel. And with Bosch, we promise a fix within 48 hours. You're able to upgrade and patch that security vulnerability with ease and get that safety at your OS level. We also see that with Bosch, we get VM resurrection. Because we're using Bosch as a tool for provisioning your Kubernetes clusters, Bosch knows about the state of all of your master nodes and all of your worker nodes and can keep track of each of these nodes' health. And if it ever sees a discrepancy between the expected state of the world, which is usually that everything should be running smoothly, and the actual state of the world, it can go in and try to fix it without any manual intervention necessary by the operator. We also see that with Bosch, it's security aware. And so as we talk about flexibility in Kubernetes, one of the things that allows for a lot of flexibility is your choice of how to set up secure communication between different parts of the Kubernetes system. And so there's a lot of CA certs, um, keys, lots of secrets that you can set up, and that can be really difficult to not only generate, but keep track of and maintain. And so with Bosch, we're able to actually use a third-party tool called CredHub to not only generate these secrets for you, these certs and keys, but also store them in a secure fashion. So all you have to do is say, I actually want this secure setup, and Bosch will take care of the actual generation and maintenance of these secrets for you. Um, and lastly, we see with Bosch that it allows for reproducible and configurable Kubernetes clusters. So everything we've listed above in this list really focuses on making sure that your clusters are up and running. But in the worst case scenario, if your cluster completely completely gets destroyed, it's easy through the way that we deploy Kubernetes clusters with Bosch to reproduce the exact same configuration and have a replacement up and running with ease. And we've seen that with Bosch, it's proven tooling. It's been around eight years, as a lot of you in this room may know. We see its success with Cloud Foundry, which is definitely a complex distributed system in and of itself. And so, now that we've sort of gotten the lay of the land, Kubernetes, PKS, Bosch, how do these all actually work together? So let's put together the pieces. At the bottom layer, we'll have our infrastructure, right? And you deploy Bosch on top of that, usually in the form of deploying Ops Manager. From there, you'll install PKS as a tile on Ops Manager, and Bosch will deploy PKS and watch it to make sure your PKS installation is up and running. And from there, you can interact with PKS via the PKS CLI, to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, which Bosch will also watch and ensure this healthiness of. And you can do this, as we said, for multiple clusters. So we can see we can deploy another Kubernetes cluster, and Bosch can watch that cluster as well. 
So hopefully we all see the benefits of PKS, why we would want to use it, how it sort of works at a high level under the hood, and now we can delve into some use cases, right? Some new features provided in PKS 1.1 and upcoming features in 1.2 for how to optimize clusters through examining different use cases. Cool, thank you, Angela. So let's look at our first use case, um, high availability. We'll look at it with, um, through the lens of our persona, Maya. She is a developer operations engineer. Um, she is tasked with managing a fleet of clusters running production workloads. Um, her responsibilities are to have highly available workloads, to um, have little to no control plane downtime, to ensure that um, there's as little production impact during a failure scenario, and um, to re reduce risk of data loss. So she can achieve all of these by having a highly available PKS setup um, and um, eliminating any single points of failure. So given this is a Kubernetes cluster to, um, provisioned using PKS, where master and etcd are co-located, there are quite a few single points of failure here. And so, because um, the master etcd VM can go down and no new workloads can be scheduled and the worker VM can go down and there will definitely be um, workload downtime. So we recommend having a multi-master, multi-worker setup. Um, here you can see all of the workers are sending their heartbeat to the master VMs, um, to the Cube API server job. Um, and what I haven't shown is how also that the etcd nodes are in constant communication, forming consensus and um, forming a quorum. And you can do this um, setup by going into the plan tab on the tile and just setting the number of worker nodes and master nodes for your cluster. Yeah, so we recommend having three master nodes and three worker nodes. So that when the master node goes down, the, the cluster just continues to work as it is because there is still consensus um, and there is still quorum with etcd. And eventually Bosch will resurrect the failed VM. Similarly, for the worker nodes, given that there are workloads running on the workers and a worker node goes down, Kubernetes will simply reschedule the workloads on, a, on, a, on an existing healthy worker and Bosch will eventually resurrect the unhealthy worker which will then join the cluster. Um, so this is great and all, but we can see there's still a single point of failure in that they're all placed in the same AZ. So if an availability zone goes down, then you know Maya is not uh, fulfilling her responsibilities. So we re in addition to having a multi-master etcd, multi-worker setup, we also um, recommend having them distributed across availability zones. Um, and similarly to the number of master nodes and must worker nodes, you can, you can uh, configure this in the plan tab um, by selecting all of the different AZs you want to place your master and etcd nodes and worker nodes in. Um, we recommend having two worker nodes per AZ because in the scenario where you have a persistent volume attached to a worker node and the worker node goes down, it just simply reattaches itself to a separate, different worker node in the same AZ. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Angela, who's going to be uh, showing a demo um, with just showing like AZ failure. Great. So this should hopefully be the most boring demo ever, because in this scenario, we're really hoping to show that you know everything still works when we have multi uh, or when we have an AZ failure, right? So log me out of this. Got to reset up. Um, that's unexciting. But what we're going to do here is we're going to be targeting a PKS installation that I've pre-installed. So you see I'm logging in here. And what we do here is the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do PKS clusters. And we see the cluster that I've already created. It's called Spring One Demo. It's a planned medium. And if we look at Bosch VMs, we see that I've set it up in such a fashion so that it should be HA. We have three masters, three workers, because I don't care about persistent volumes right now. Um, and we see that they're striped across Multiple, avail multiple availability zones. Um, let's see, there we go. It's just a little finicky. So we'll also see if I do kube control, um, get notes, 
that it's aware of all three nodes that we currently have set up. And if we do kubectl get pods in the namespace default, we'll see that I've deployed a daemon set and a replica set if it works again. Great. So we see we have a di three different pods for the daemon set because we have three different nodes and we have um, three replication controllers because that's what I've set it to. So now to simulate in AZ failure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go into a G the GCP console and I'm literally just going to delete the worker and master in a single AZ. And we see here that I found it by looking at US Central 1F for the PKS deployment that I have currently installed. Um, and this is going to take a little bit of time to delete, but the reason that this is simulating an AZ failure, right, is because we're doing this out of band of Bosch's knowledge. Because I'm deleting it in the console, Bosch is assuming that these VMs should be up and running. I haven't deleted it through Bosch. So Bosch is going to say, hey, um, these VMs, they should still be around, and for some reason they're not. Um, I'm also gonna make this bigger so you all can actually see it. Sorry about that. Um, and so if we run Bosch VMs here, it's going to take a little bit of time to actually come back versus when we saw it before. And that's because Bosch is going to be trying to reach out to these VMs that are currently being deleted, and it's going to knock it back a response. And eventually, it'll show that the master and worker in this availability zone that we've just deleted come back with an unresponsive agent, right? Um, glad you could see that for half a second. Um, but really, so what we see here is that um, eventually, um, well, eventually the screen will come back up. Who thought the technical difficulties would be in showing you this? Um, and it will take, oh, well actually, it took a perfect amount of time. So we see that the instances were successfully deleted. And so if we come back here and we run kubectl get nodes again, we see that there are now two, VN, two VMs or two nodes that we know about because the third one's been deleted. But we see that through the action of me even running kubectl get nodes, and get back this response that the masters are still in a healthy state because we have quorum, we have two masters still up and running um, because otherwise the kube API server wouldn't be responsive to me. And furthermore, if we do kube control get pods in the default namespace, we'll see what, that we have two um, pods for the daemon set because again, we have two nodes, so this is expected behavior, but we still have the three replication controllers because our replication controller that was on the VM that has been deleted was successfully rescheduled onto a different node. And eventually, Bosch would be doing scans of the state of all of these, would see that the master and worker are no longer there, and would go ahead and resurrect it. It takes a little bit of time. If you wanna see it actually happen, I would say you should go out, kick the tires yourself, and try it out. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, we see that it's really boring, right? Everything just continues to work which is always a good thing. And with that, I'll hand it back to Nikita to finish off talking about high availability. Yeah, just um, some additional things to consider are like to use Kubernetes best practices to ensure that your workloads are highly available. Um, we've listed some here, replicas, pod affinity and anti-affinity nodes, which decide where your pods and your replication, um, replica, replica, replication controllers are scheduled. Um, horizontal pod auto-scaling, this you get for free with PKS, um, as of PKS 1.2, actually. Uh, and yeah, pod disruption budgets, and these are just some of the things that um, the community is doing to make sure that their workloads are highly available. Cool. And with that, we'll move away from the HA use case and into the identity use case. So we'll consider another persona, stepping away from Maya, and we'll consider the persona of Audra. Audra is a service provider. You might have guessed from identity. What we really care about is knowing who exactly should be able to access what cluster. And Audra's role as a service provider is really to allocate clusters to untrusted parties, who in this case we'll call Naomi. So these untrusted parties might be other organizations who may want to have access to a cluster but don't want to have to deal with the management and deployment of these clusters themselves. So Audra, as a service provider, giving these clusters to untrusted tenants, really cares about security and tenancy. She wants to make sure that clusters that she's provisioning 
for one user are only accessible to that specific user, and that that user, Naomi, only has access to a certain subset of commands to perform on that cluster, right? You don't want to give cluster admin privileges to an untrusted tenant, even if that untrusted tenant is the only one using that cluster. And so one way we see that's available to us in order to provide for this service provider use case is LDAP integration for clusters, which is going to be released with PKS 1.2. Um, so many of you in this room are probably familiar with LDAP, but a lot of times your LDAP server is used to find information about users or groups, right? And most organizations, most companies have an LDAP server already set up for a variety of different use cases. So it comes as sort of a natural extension, um, the familiarity of LDAP, to be able to use an LDAP server to actually form groups for different untrusted tenants and then give permissions to certain groups. So instead of having to create a new source of truth within PKS for what um, customers, what people can access what cluster, if you can use a pre-existing LDAP server or set up a new LDAP server um, and create these group-like permissions, it becomes a lot more intuitive and easy to reason about. So how does this LDAP integration for clusters workflow actually occur? How do we actually set it up and use it? Well, we start with Audra, who configures LDAP and PKS. And you can find this under the UAA section of the PKS tile, where you choose to configure your UAA user account as an LDAP server. It can then provide information about an existing LDAP server. From there, Audra would deploy the PKS tile. She would create a cluster for Naomi and then create using the kube control a cluster role binding that binds Naomi's LDAP group to a specific role that has a set of permissions for the actions that Naomi should actually be able to run on the cluster. And then simply let Naomi know that she can access the cluster. And from there, it becomes even simpler. Naomi gets the kube config and then is able to run actions on that cluster. And when she runs actions on that cluster, let's say, for example, kube control get pods, what actually is happening is that her request goes to the kube API server on the master, which has been configured to know to reach out externally to UAA with the OIDC information present in her kube config. And from there, UAA has been configured, as we saw in the tile, to know to reach out to this external LDAP server to see whether or not Naomi actually is allowed to perform this action. The information gets trickled back up, and eventually Naomi is either allowed to continue on with her command or not. Um, and so we see some benefits to the identity use case through LDAP integration. First, with LDAP integration, we're now getting token-based authentication versus service accounts. So Kubernetes service accounts were the way previous to PKS 1.2 that you would communicate with your Kube API server in your clusters. But service accounts really are meant for long-lived use cases. And for somebody like a service provider who's allocating and then unallocating clusters to different users, it's not great to have a long-lived service account in a kube config to give to their untrusted tenants because eventually you might want to revoke that access. And it's a lot more difficult to do so with a long-lived service account than with the token-based authentication method. Because in this scenario now, all Audra, all your service provider has to do is simply delete the cluster role binding between the LDAP group and the role, and she'll no longer have that role's permissions. So we see that you can revoke access easier. The other thing we see is that we can give group-based access instead of individual. So we can have our source of truth be the LDAP server. You can see what users belong in what group. You can give and revoke access based on groups. Instead of trying to have to keep track of yourself and mapping of service accounts that I've handed out in kube configs to different users, um, and keep track of that because that gets really messy, right? So it's a lot more simpler and intuitive to reason about. And with that, we've exited the identity track and we'll take a look at sort of what's next. What can we expect beyond these two use cases? Yeah, so some of the things that we're working on for the future is to continue to make PKS a turnkey solution because the more we put into the platform, the less uh, our customers have to bring themselves 
So we're uh, looking at adding logging and monitoring solutions as a first-class citizen in uh, PKS, similar to the PaaS world. And we're looking at multi-cluster and fleet management solutions so um, that many clusters can be managed by as few operators as necessary. Um, we are looking at, in that realm, um, some quota management and access control um, features. Um, yeah, and in the near future, we'll also be adding backup and restore functionality to make the platform resilient and highly available. Um, and PKS is supported on GCP and vSphere currently, and as of 1.2, it'll be supported on AWS and um, Azure Next, and like we. We want to use, uh, we want it to be available for any choice of IaaS for our customers. Um, and lastly, um, we're, look, we're constantly looking to be conformant with the Kubernetes community. So we will be ingesting the latest Kubernetes uh, releases out there, and we run conformance tests um, before we ship. And so, yeah, really giving that vanilla Kubernetes experience um, to our customers. So that's sort of the general idea of where we're heading, dependent on priorities and how they shift, et cetera, obviously. Um, but if, if any of you all have any feedback for the product and have used it and tried it and like want us to take that back, I would be happy to you know, take it back to the product, um, any new feature requests, anything like that. Um, yeah, so with that, um, just want to thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have, yeah. Yeah, thank you.